Hi, I'm Brad, and this is... I'm Jerry Ellsworth from Tilt 5. Awesome. Um, I just got trying a, I just I just tried a demo of Tilt 5. My, my brain is clearly flustered from it because it was a very good experience. Um, let's start with the beginnings of Tilt 5. How long have you been working on this thing? Here? Uh, a long time. Uh, so it actually started at Valve Software probably about 12 years ago or more. I'd have to actually go back and try to figure it out. So Gabe Newell recruited me into the company to put their hardware team together. And uh, he gave me the exciting like mission mm -hmm. of bringing the entire family together to play games. So we got to experiment on a bunch of different things and I discovered this optical technique that later on after Valve that we were able to productize into these glasses. It must feel really good to finally know that these are shipping to consumers, right? Oh, yes. It's, it's wonderful because it's been so long. Um, I think I was telling you earlier when we were looking at some prototypes that, you know, being experienced in the XR space, I could, in the crude prototypes, I could see there was a lot of potential there, but it took a long time to refine it so that it's just this wonderful visual experience. Um, much longer than I expected. Um, probably could have moved faster if I didn't have a couple hiccups along the way. <laughs> cough, yeah. cough, cast yeah. AR. But <laughs> Maybe uh, if you're okay with it, do you want to talk about some of those hiccups a little bit? Give sure. better history. So um, you said you, you, know, you started this project at Valve. Uh, do you want to start with maybe that hiccup to begin with? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Valve's an interesting place. I don't know how much you want to go into it, but I can ramble about Valve for a while. Um, so Valve's a unique place where you're, when you're hired, you're giving, given very f little direction except for like always think of the customer, do what's right for the customer and do what's right for the company. You know, obviously I had that kind of mission that I was on as well. So you're a little bit rudderless for a while in the company as you try to figure out the culture. Um, but we put together a really amazing team and we were just researching anything that would make games more compelling, more relatable to a broader audience. So, you know, out of that, a lot of VR technology that ended up seeding Oculus, the HTC Vive came out of that, just a ton of stuff that never saw the light of day. It was just really amazing research happened. And uh, because there's no management structure inside Valve, um, there's different ways to n maneuver Valve and, you know, not get in trouble, which I'm not good at. <laughs> so, you know, one of the techniques is just keep your head low and just, you know, don't, don't push any bold ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, and in fact, when after having some of my first augmented reality um, experiences that I tried, like I was telling you earlier, we tried, we brought Dota 2 to an AR system and for the first time I could spectate on a table. I'm like, this is it. This is how everyone comes together to play games in the future. And I was sold. And so I started preaching that <laughs> very loudly within the company. And it's encouraged. Like if you feel conviction for what you're doing, you need to promote it and rally within the company. But it also puts you in the um, gun site, danger yeah. zone, right? In fact, at one point I was talking to Gabe, I'm like, I don't know why I'm getting like all this negative reaction to doing augmented reality. You know, I really believe in it. And his piece of advice, it's not very comforting. He said, you know, all the best things that have ever happened inside Valve were done by like a couple people with arrows sticking out of their back. So uh, as I pushed more and more on augmented reality, there started to become more of a divide in which direction we should go. There was a lot of folks that wanted to go like purely VR, and then there was a group of us that wanted to do augmented reality, and we had a lot of arrows in our back. And so, you know, there was an immune response to um, us AR folks, and they ended up firing us all. Right. Yeah, which was really tragic. Um, it was sad because we'd gone from kind of simple AR systems that might look something like an Nreal headset, mm -hmm. you know, the bird bath type optics. We'd done waveguides, which would be like Magic Leap or HoloLens. And then I had stumbled onto this optical technique that uses retroreflective material to generate the images. And like, oh, this is it. This is yeah. a low cost way to solve all these problems. 
And as uh, they were letting me go, it was actually Gabe Newell brought me to his office along with like the HR people sitting in there. And he gave me a little bit of a pep talk. Um, and I was, when I found out I was gonna get laid off, I was gonna go in there and give him a peace of mind. And it was this huge emotional roller coaster of like at one point I'm like trying to be super aggressive to the next moment I'm like, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I'm getting teary eyed and weepy. <laughs> and um, uh, as I was kind of walking towards the door, I'm like, Gabe, this project I'm working on is going to die. You should just sell it to me. And he's like, okay. It was just like, boom, like that. And so then I rushed out of his office. I went back to the hardware lab to all the AR folks that were getting laid off. I'm like, do you guys want to do this? Like, I, Gabe said he would sell me the technology. Wow. So it was pretty amazing. Like, as, you know, all the good and bad of Valve and stuff like that, Gabe was very generous at that, that point. So for 100 bucks. He let me take the entire AR lab that hadn't been pilfered. It was funny. It's like, wow. it was so weird. It was the weirdest kind of like layoff I've ever been around because normally any company, you show up and your key card doesn't work and there's an HR person there and say like, by the way, you're part of a downsize or something. Um, instead, they like let everyone know and then you sat around all day for your chance to go talk to HR. It's <laughs> nerve wracking. And it was very interesting. At least they lived up to what uh, they they said when yeah. they hired me and when we were recruiting team members. A lot of times, I'm sorry, it's a rambly story, but no, no, uh, they, I'm sure they love this for sure. <laughs> so a lot of times, there's a very high bar to get inside a Valve. Um, on a lot of different dimensions, they're just evaluating the people coming in, and there's always a chance for you to advocate for a candidate. And they tell you, like, your neck is on the line uh, for this person if we bring them in. And if they have to be let go, you have to be the t person to tell them. And so, you know, Gabe, <laughs> Gabe let me go, which is like, wow, you know, the guy that brought me in uh, let me go. <laughs> uh, that's, geez. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've heard this story a couple times, um, and every time I hear it, it's just like, it, it, it makes me think because, I, you know, again, I just tried this demo and it, it's really good. Like anyone who hasn't tried this um, or really many AR prototypes in general or products, AR is still 12 years later after what Jerry and her team built um, in Valve Lab. And it's just like there's nothing. They, they don't bring any value. But trying this on and, and spending 30 minutes with the game board and just seeing all the issues it solves and this experience it brings it just can't help make you think like this is amazing now imagine if it was brought to market back then oh yeah i mean if valve would have let us continue yeah. you know we could be like light years ahead because uh valve and gabe didn't uh limit us on our spend right. like we were very aware of what we were spending there. That was part of their, like, they gave you a credit card. They're like, spend as much as you want. You need expensive equipment to spend as much as you want, but just make sure that it's a valuable purchase. And, you know, we could have put a lot of money into this and like refined it even further. And all the resources Valve had, it's like, it's fun to imagine what it would have been like. Um, but, you know, that's, um, maybe it's a flaw I had, right? Mm -hmm. You know. It was so early on, I didn't know how to represent the value proposition of what it was going to be like. And it actually, this like eight years outside of Valve is exactly what I needed to refine it and be able to talk about it and be able to present it in a way. Plus, <clears throat> now all the cards are on the table too. Mm -hmm. It's like, great, we have Unreal, we've got it, uh, Leap Motion and Snap Glasses, and they all like solve different problems. Um, there's not this notion that just right around the corner there's going to be some kind of AR device that solves all of our worldly problems. Like, yeah. So, so the dream got a lot more realistic over these years for sure, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We were talking earlier, we went through the VR um, trough of delusionment. Is that what it's called? Um, that was a painful time, but it was necessary to kind of reset the hype out there and get people thinking about the long tail of growth to make um, these markets real, which I think
think happens in every market. I can't point to a single industry that happened overnight without like some kind of hype, some kind of crash, and then some kind of long tail of evolution to the point where now, you know, everyone has a device. I, I do want to touch up on this topic again, but but just one more final thing about the valve, and then we can put that all behind us. Um, do you feel since you know a, a lot of stuff that came from Valve ended up at Oculus or, or stuff like that, um, and you know because well now they're called Meta, they're the big player. Do you feel there's anything? historical with this industry that you feel has been rewritten because they're the big players or there's anything that you want to oh, talk yeah. about? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember what the book was called, but there was a story that kind of documented the Facebook side of Oculus, and I think that is incomplete. Mm -hmm. um, and even as I talked to some of the folks that are still at Valve that were around during this time where there was a lot of brain transfer of information to Oculus, you know, the story's a little bit muddy. Mm -hmm. So... Another thing that put arrows in my back was we had a group working on VR led by um, Abrash. Um, his take on it is like, <clears throat> if um, VR becomes successful, then naturally Valve will benefit from that. So we should just give away all the technology. So Oculus and Carmack and you know all those folks were coming through constantly and we were giving them hardware. There's the product people, like there was a big group of us that have designed products most of our life. We're like, no, we need competitive advantage. We need to control it. We need to make sure it's a great experience. We need to profit from it. And so there was this big divide. And that was really stressful. It was really stressful for me because all our hard work was going out the door. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that like Oculus raised a bunch of money to grow their company all on Valve um, uh, hardware systems. Like, We'd given them the marker PTAM room, yeah. and they used that to pitch injuries and Horowitz and all these um, venture capitalists that helped them scale their company. And then the first thing they do is they sell out to Facebook and start talking about closing off the platform so you can't get your content on, on Steam. And now where are we today? Quest, closed, right. you know, you jailbreak it and do side quest and stuff. But it's still the, the notion that it would benefit Valve, I was over, overrated mm. or overstated. Um, I think Valve would have done better to just own it and let um, Oculus go off on their own and try to find their way. Yeah, Valve was clearly focused on the Steam platform side of things, basically is what you're trying to say, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember, uh, I mean, you can still go back on Reddit and see the rumored pictures back then when there was pictures of Zuckerberg entering that Oculus version of the the lighthouse demo room or whatever and just like I can only imagine well the first one they were showing off it was probably the marker p tam room so it had april tags on every single surface that one yeah yeah the number of hours i've spent in marker p tam land is like incredible because first of all you you make a room you had to calibrate it which was this long arduous process of moving cameras around and taking a look at all of these um, april tags it got to the point where we started naming the April tags. So we had uh, dog frisbee, because if you stared at it enough, it looked like a dog chasing a frisbee. We had um, poopy bird that looked like a bird that was pooping. And we got a little loony, you yeah. know, these late nights. So what was really magical about the Valve hardware team is there was like a core of us, and it was mostly, I'd say, the product people versus, say, the researcher folks that, um, believed in the mission so much. We were there ungodly hours, so we'd get in, you know, a reasonable nerd hour of like 10 o'clock or so, but we'd be there past midnight very frequently, like working on it, because we believed in it so much. So oh, now you own it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, you can drop these, they're pretty robust. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we were, we were just there constantly working on these things. That's why we started having delusions of like pooping birds and stuff like that. Um, because it was very special and magical. Yeah. Um, Valve is, Valve is great. I still have a lot of like, don't get me wrong. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't like how it ended, but there's something to Valve that can be highly efficient if some of these other things weren't a factor. Yeah. The ability to have the mission and enough money yeah. to be able to do this to just go do the right thing basically gives you a lot of um, latitude to go and like try to figure out the right thing for the end user.
That's that's a perfect way. I I, I like that how you say that because um, earlier we were talking a little bit about. I mean, um, this is a startup that you have started up from kind of ground zero after another hiccup. And um, what were you saying that like when you're starting up this company, what, what what kind of culture are you trying to set for people at work here? Yeah, that's a complicated question. Um, well, maybe we talk about the cast AR um, yeah. hiccup, and then that can be like position why yeah. we're doing things differently here. So after Valve, um, a group of us got together and we started a company called Cast AR to build this product. Mm -hmm. It's like this is going to be magical. You know, we need to build it. And so Valve for a hundred bucks basically gave us a lab. We got all the computers and a bunch of gear. I was just about ready to say also the stuff that hadn't been pilfered. So mm -hmm. <laughs> even when I was getting fired, I came back to my desk and people would, had taken oscilloscopes and stuff off my, oh my desk gosh. and like started taking stuff. But anyway, that was funny. But anyway, we got a lot of the stuff out of the lab and that's what seeded Cast AR. What was interesting is I'd never run a venture backed startup. So I was super scared to do that. And so I didn't know how, and so I was too scared to be the CEO of the company. So I went out and I hired a CEO to run the company, and uh, my co-founder and I, we bootstrapped the company for six months or so, and we got the CEO, we raised a little bit of money, and, and got going, and everything was okay. The CEO was actually quite good. He was kind of a scrappy startup guy and was kind of setting the culture in the company pretty, pretty well. And then uh, we raised some money from Andy Rubin's star, uh, venture capital fund. And Andy Rubin, you know, he's had a lot of bad press recently, but unaware of it at the time. But he has this moonshot like theory, right? Mm -hmm. Dump a bunch of money in, move really fast, and some things will survive and some things will fizzle. And so immediately after we took this money from Andy Rubin, we started having trouble between them and our CEO because he was more pragmatic about like, these things don't come overnight. So they pushed him out of the company and they started bringing in Disney and Zanga executives and Sony executives into the company. And then they started hiring their buddies. Um, I found myself pushed into a corner. They're like, just sit over there and invent technology. We got this. And it was really sad to kind of watch the company culture go from you know, what it was to like very corporate and um, kind of artificial. Like we were talking about marketing and stuff and right. genuine marketing versus, you know, kind of corporate marketing. And it was just like, we just burned through money like crazy and just crashed the thing in the ground, made like a $15 million crater in the ground. And all I could do is just sit there and watch it happen. And so I learned a lot about company culture, you know, uh, leadership, um, trying to boil the ocean. This was another big problem we had at Cast AR. It was like, uh, back then, uh, virtual reality was on a big, huge hype cycle. AR was following right behind it. And so to keep up with the Joneses, as they say, we were like, we can do everything for everyone. That was kind of our position. Right. And so that that's not good when you're trying to lead a company. If you're trying to like bite off everything your engineers, your marketing team, no one really knows what your product is and what the value proposition is. So we were completely rudderless as a company. So not a surprise that we burned through all the money and didn't have much to, um, to, to show at the end of it. We had like great prototypes, they were okay, but not the innovation that we've had, <clears throat> excuse me, at, uh, since Tilt 5 started just three or so years ago. So. I'm all by myself. All these executives have ex ex exited stage left, and I'm sitting in an empty office and really, really sad. I mean, I'm really sad. Again, second time this dream has been ripped away from me, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and I get a phone call out of the blue, and I pick it up, and it's like, hey, it's Nolan. And Nolan, Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari, and I maybe had met him once. And he's like, I saw your technology at some event. It's magical. It's going to change the world. This is going to be in 100 million homes. I just want to give you a pep talk or some advice. Like, you just need to ha figure out how to get this going yeah. and get it. 
and it's possible. I don't know how to tell you. Just go figure it out. And that was an amazing moment where I could have just thrown thrown everything away and taken you know lots of people wanted to hire me. I could have went to any like company and got a like a high paying job. But instead, I go back to the team, my core team that were like really great cultural kind of fit type of people. I'm like, hey, we can do this. Like, you know, I reached out to a bunch of mentors. Like, how do you do it after you have such a colossal failure, embarrassing failure? And uh, a group of us came together. My co-founder, he's like, I'll do it, but you have to lead the company. You've always had the vision of what this should be. So you should be CEO. You should never let go of that position. And so that's what we did. We uh, put our own money into it. We bought the assets again. It's the second time that we bought the technology. And um, instead of just rushing off and trying to raise money and, and do this thing, we spent some time thinking about what we were going to do. What's our culture going to be like? Like, what, who do we want to surround ourselves with? How do we want to communicate with our audience? What audience we're going after? Mm -hmm. You know, what the product should be? And we just spent a ton of time. And we looked at a bunch of different things. There's, this technology is super useful in things that are non-gaming, too. Or like, well, maybe education. Let's look at that. And we thought about it. We analyzed it. And we're like, we know nothing about education. You know, maybe data visualization. Maybe it could be a way to visualize data or do CAD. And we looked at that, and it's, again, it's like don't know anything about, you know, productivity tools. And so, all of the team, like our DNA, is gaming. Yeah. Like as you can tell, as you go through the office, like every corner, there's something gaming related. And it's like it's a really interesting audience to go after. There's a different bar that you have to hit. Like it's easier to delight people than to make a productivity tool. And um, it made it very clear what to throw out of the product and what to keep in the product. And then uh, we went out, raised a little bit of money from uh, angel investors. We bootstrapped a bunch of it ourselves. We worked a lot of times. We were moments away from going out of business probably four times the first year. Um, and just taking our own money and putting it on the table to keep paying people. But uh, having that um, stress on us of not having enough money and having the new focus really kind of sharpened our what we were going to do. So it actually kind of was good that we went through that, that stress. And it's still, I don't want to portray that like things are easy for us now. They're not easy, right? We have to think about every penny we spend and how we market. And, and by the way, you can pre... <laughs> You can pre-order your units now. We're, by the end of the summer, we should be caught up on our backlog, and wow. you can get your unit. So, um, five bucks, you can go get in line. So don't, do it. don't miss out. I already did it. Um, Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, there, there was one story. I, I again, there, there's probably a lot of stories you've told different people, but like, th there's still so much um, surprising things that a lot of people still don't know about your history and stuff. Um, at the end of Cast AR, I think it was something like this, where you had um, two different very popular CEOs come in to try a demo. Um, yeah, I'm sure you know what story I'm talking about, maybe, with, uh, I think it was Bill Gates and then Zuckerberg. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, uh, a thing here in Silicon Valley is a fluff and dump. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we built this big org, and maybe that was their intention from the beginning. It kind of seems like it. So they, we were 90 people. We had these, like, amazing CEOs and executives, and so they started to shop us around. So Bill Gates comes out. Uh, it was pretty interesting. We knew he was coming a day earlier, so, so we set up a demo, and we kind of got ready and cleaned the office up and everything. He comes through, and it's like... Pretty interesting. He, he comes in, it's just like him and his secretary or something, and he tries the demo, and he's like, hmm, interesting, hmm, hmm. And we're going through, like, all our wow moment demos. Like, we have these demos that almost everyone's like, wow, cool, or, you know. And he's just, like, really deadpan. And I'm like, oh, man, he is not liking this. <laughs> and so, you know, he spends, like, 20 minutes with it. He takes it off, and he's like, that's very good. I wish he said something like, 
I, I wish our team like had some of this inspiration. And he said something along those lines and I'm like, oh wow. And then he starts asking like all these really technical nerdy questions about it, like how many pixels per degree and like what's the interface for this? And I'm like, I'm liking this, that's <laughs> kind of cool. Yeah. And then maybe a week later, not very much <laughs> later, Zuckerberg comes out and it was totally different. Um, first of all, he has a security detail that comes through the day before. No one is to talk to Zuckerberg and people are to be out of sight and they do the security sweep. And then before he comes, they do a security sweep and he shows up, he comes in super cocky. He tries it and he's like playing games. We get some wow moments out of him and stuff. And uh, he said a few things I thought was kind of funny. He's like, the field of view is so big that it's bigger than the game board. Like, why do you do that? <laughs> right. Like, well, that's the point, yeah. right? It's, like, it's gotta be bigger. So when you're, you kind of look off to the side, you still see the image. Like, wow. And uh, I don't know. We had a little bit of a conversation, and uh, he said something like, "Yeah, I wish Abrash would move faster." And I, I bit my tongue. Like, <laughs> like I, like I could have guessed where it was gonna go with Abrash. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. Abrash, I enjoyed my time with Abrash. Um, we played pinball together. I'm a pinball collector and stuff like that. But he comes from a different world. He's a researcher. And right. so my frustration with Abrash all the time, besides like pitching the stuff over the fence to Oculus, was we would be working on a VR, XR type product or a game controller or something. And uh, he'd be like, well, if you could just kind of cross this line as far as functionality, and I, th I think we'll be there. And then we would like get across that finish line as far as functionality you'd go, I actually think it's out over here. And it was kind of his researcher side coming yeah. out. So it's always like this moving target. And you kind of look back at Facebook reality labs and there was like, in 2016, we're gonna have AR glasses. In 2018, we're gonna have AR glasses. In 2020, 2022, where are we today? How much AR functionality do we have? Zero. Um, so I imagine there's like a bar that's like. It's ridiculously high. Yeah, yeah, and it makes sense in a big company to have a high bar, but you know. You can only do so much with the laws of physics. Physics is hard. That's what's limiting, you know, AR. VR is uh, actually pretty trivial to do, mm -hmm. and it's kind of funny, like Oculus and even the, you know, Index and Vive. Like there's very little innovation. It's still plastic lenses in front of LCD screens. Yeah. And all this pancake optics is maybe an improvement in, in one direction, but it's actually, you know, as more of those get on the market, people are gonna start to see the limitations of, you know, adding two lenses instead right. of one lens to it. Yeah. I always laugh, our system, um, a lot of times we talk to various folks, we tried to make it look not high tech because we want like grandma to pick it up and play like virtual clay with the grandkids and then the grandkids to play like some kind of you know action game like we want it to be approachable and so the amount of optics we have in there is like 24 lenses per projector oh wow so it's like even though it looks super simple optically you know it's like 24 times more complicated than a vr headset yeah yeah it's like if I wanted to do VR, it would be trivial to like make a VR headset. But you know, we're try we're striving for something much bigger. Like, how do we really make an impact that's positive in the world? Like, millions and millions of people liking it. Well, yeah, there's definitely. Um, I think for your goal, like you guys have nailed it again for that family experience. Um, during our demo, she was able each time to just you know point to things like how to control stuff. You can't do that in VR, right? You have to like just hope to God that you're like, oh, the A button is on your right, right next to your right thumb, and just hope that they get that, right? But no, she, you know, she can just point at get it that and button. Yeah. have the whole occlusion on the board still happening. So, so I don't know if you noticed also, and I, this is what I think is really magic about um, AR experiences is we were looking each other in the eye and we were expressing emotions. I saw the joy in your eyes. I could like. You know, we had that intimate connection, which is really important when you want to have like a social uh, gaming experience.
And that's completely lost in VR. I don't think any amount of like eye tracking cameras or virtual faces are gonna like really get you 100% mm -hmm. of the way there. Okay, maybe I, I retract that. <laughs> 40 years from now, things are going to be completely different. I don't want to be Bill Gates, wink, wink, saying that's only 640K is all we need. But, right, right. you know, w the level of connection you can have with people in an AR system versus a VR system is so much higher and it elevates the gaming experience. It's, it's so funny. We didn't get a chance to, like, try any of the multiplayer experiences. But what's really cool, you can take some of the kind of even lamest games, like, one of the first times I experienced this was at Valve. We had a five-player maze game where you could run your character through a maze, had pretty high walls because you could hide behind walls, had zombies inside, and you could shoot bullets. You could shoot, shoot super bullets that were really big. And the gameplay mechanic and the game loop was really dumb. Right. Um, but having five people there, and our input scheme was dumb too. <laughs> but that was actually the magic of it. You led your character by just kind of moving your character and it would run towards your wand pointer. So now the game, instead of just being this dumb game play that's centered on the table, it's like, I'm looking at you mm -hmm. and like, what are you doing with your wand? Oh, you moved your wand to the right, so I know you're moving in my direction. So now I'm gonna try to subtly move my wand to this direction. Um, it really heightened the experience, like a 10X you know, in experience increase <laughs> over right. the dumb little game. And we experience that today on like, you know, the games that we have, like you play Battle Planet. Like that's gonna be available as a co-op game. That's gonna be insanely fun running around that globe with all those, you know, either griefing each other or helping each other defend right. the planet. No, um, I think there is definitely something to that. Um, the fact that you can see people like, the biggest applications even in VR like with users daily and everything, they're all social VR applications. Like VR chat is like the biggest one. Um, and you see Facebook, they're constantly, you know, they're, tr they're constantly showing off research of their codec avatars, which are like, oh, we're gonna be able to scan our real bodies and put them in and like, you know, it, it's still a very far goal for these things, um, but there is, Every company is working in XR. They they do see there is a potential for social. So you guys again by being an AR system, uh, multiplayer board, you you guys have that. So yeah, we have a kind of a, a concept that I think goes a little against the grain of like Facebook Horizons and some of these VR hangout spots. It's like I think when I look at their value proposition is like <laughs> to be very cynical. Yeah. Your life sucks. We're going to synthesize everything around you and stick you into this virtual world, right? If you want to be completely cyn cynical. You know, I think our approach is more like your world's beautiful. Like right. your home's great. You want to see your TV while you're playing a game and your beer, right? You know, we want to have delightful XR experiences in interesting places like your home or your office or your school. And uh, I think that's a more approachable um, direction to go. You're going to get more adoption that way, where it's it's just this beautiful thing that's part of your already beautiful world. I don't know. I mean, yeah, my marketing <laughs> site coming out, but it's just like you're, 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 you think you're talking to VCs right now, is what you're trying to say? I, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I should. It's a game-changing cloud-based. <laughs> um, no, I, I I think it's been working pretty well. Like uh, adoption in general, like. You guys had a very successful Kickstarter, and I think you Life said earlier AR project. Yeah, Ooh. like that—that's that's huge. Um, Pre-sales are going really fast. It's it's great. We're having a hard time keeping up with production right now. You walked in as we were having like a very tense uh, discussion with our uh, manufacturer of like, we need more capacity. Right. We need more capacity. Give us more resources. <laughs> yeah, and um, I mean, I, I think. Are pre-orders worldwide yet, or is it just? Very soon, um, very, very soon. Very soon, yeah. yeah we, we locked it down, so we did a transition from the backer kit and everything that comes with Kickstarter, which could do worldwide, and then we had to build up a, a better website so we could um, promote all of the third-party content, but we moved to a different shopping system. It's really complicated, like we, 
ship anywhere in Europe, there's like different VAT and different taxes and all kinds of stuff that yeah. needs to be tracked. And so I'm told any day now, all of that's been programmed into the website. So, you know, if you're overseas, stay tuned, you'll be able to, you know, pre-order and, you know, as long as uh, China doesn't get shut down with yeah. COVID again, you know, towards the end of the summer, we'll be caught up with where we are, a snapshot of today. But, you know, the the pre-sales are coming in pretty quick, so that keeps sliding out. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about the software. Like, um, I think you said they're 40? Yeah, I think it's over 40 or so. We have some universities working with our system. and. <laughs> <laughs> you were here just as my uh, chief business officer, Hans, walked by. Like, you got to see the uh, University of San Jose's uh, new demo they sent over. So it's pretty exciting to see um, this content come in. We have um, twice a week dog fooding sessions where we, uh, we take the, the latest builds of a bunch of these different games and play them internally and then provide feedback like, well, we think it might be more compelling if you do this or you change this lighting. And we also have a, a full QA um, service that's helping us like check all the games and look for bugs and make sure it's, you know, as bug free as possible. We're small, right? You know, so, you know, the, the content's going to be all over the board. So we've been working with developers, funding developers, and if we've been looking for a lot of developers that already have games that look compelling in a certain genre. So. Uh, we've been kind of spreading it around. We have pure sandbox type experiences like Figment XR. There's um, Battle Map Studios where you can do virtual tabletop where you can just play and build things and then use it in your own, say, role playing or just have collaborative fun, no code gaming type experiences, so sandboxy. And then we have a ton of puzzle games where if you just want to sit back and have a casual puzzle game and use the wand to toss things around or point at things. Uh, we have a lot of action games, strategy games. Uh, there's probably a lot of other genres I'm forgetting about, but it's it's all across the board and it's kind of cool. It's uh, so it should be something for for everybody out there. And we have a we've committed to seeding the market with um, with content. And then we just announced a big deal with Asmodi uh, Digital, where there's going to be some titles that we're going to publish under our um, control. And I'm excited about this because we're going to be on top of it. We're going to be able to pull in all the features we think are going to really make those games super compelling. And then there's, you know, some other deals in the works that are some bigger franchises that, you know, so we're just going to stair step our, we're not at Halo, we're not at Skyrim yet, but, you know, we have some pretty compelling indie stuff. I'm really excited about the folks that get our, our kits. So if you just buy one of our kits, the SDK is part of it free. Mm -hmm. And it's super easy to use our SDK. We put a ton of work into real-time editing in the SDK. So it's mostly drag and drop to get your game running. Yum. <laughs> Yum, food's here. <laughs> and you just interrupted our podcast. It's okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, uh, she was just talking about their Unity, like how they're able to do everything in the launcher and put it on the board. Uh, yeah, you got to try yeah. a pinball game yeah, I'm working I, on. Yeah, I was, I was literally asking her because she tweeted last week about just like as a, I think it was a joke originally, right? I'm not <laughs> sure, but just threw a board on one of their pinball machines, which she's, she has an obsession, like it's unhealthy probably. Yes, with, right. uh, 80 pinball machines, <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> yeah, she has a lot of pinball machines, so I was like, oh, can't you just like, it'd be cool to create a pinball thing. So they, they literally took, um, what, just a, a scene that was already created in Unity and just slapped it in the... Yeah, I'm excited about this one. It's really neat. So there's a group, it's open source, um, it's called Visual Pinball. I might, hope I got that right. And it uses PinMame, an emulator for pinball. And so there's hundreds and hundreds of tables already made for PinMame, and they ported it over to Unity. So I downloaded, this is a little thing I did just over the weekend, Downloaded their project, just did a couple tweaks to it, dragged our SDK in, and boom, you got to yeah. like see a pinball machine on the table. Super colorful, looks, you know. It looked really good. It was surprising that it was just like. And that was running thing. in the editor too. Yeah. So because our headset has upscaling and and uh, reprojection, even though in the editor it was only running like 30 frames per second, still locked to the table and buttery smooth and. Yeah, what, what, what does the reprojection usually go to? What frame rate does it go uh, to? 180. Yeah. 180. Um, that's high. <laughs> it's high, yeah. You know, that's 
that was one of the things, it's funny, all the way back to Valve days, I'm like, someday, this is how it's going to be. Yeah. And people are like, oh, I don't know, you're really going to need to be able to, you know, send all the geometry. There was just all these objections to why it wouldn't work. And I'm like, I think, you know, for a set of problems, like being able to do this interpolation is going to be just fine. And uh, so when we started Tilt 5, my co-founder, Jamie, he's like, I, I think so too. And so for the first year, he created this ability to do this reprojection. So we can take any frame rate um, images from the game engine and then upscale it and position it on the table and do all these reprojections. And it, it's beautiful. It works great. And so that means we can run on cell phones. We can run multiple glasses on one PC. And we don't have to worry about hitting 90 frames a second like in VR. Um, at Cast AR, we were trying to do like a Magic Leaf where it had a built-in like processor pack that you wore, and it was really tough. Yeah. We had to maintain this like 120 frames a second to have a good experience. Really limits the fidelity of the game. So you tried this kind of forest one. That one definitely wasn't running 60 frames a second, but it's beautiful. It has tons of geometry. It probably has millions of, of um, polygons in it. I, I think um, you were right back then because I, I see every day there's companies, every company's working on reprojection mm -hmm. techniques, either in engine or you yeah. know in platform. It's so um, I can't even imagine what content would be like without reprojection as standard yeah, these yeah, days. I mean, but, uh, Oculus and, and Valve was a time warp or something as Oculus is, but that's all still brute force through yeah. the GPU. And you have to time slice your GPU, it's just really hard on phones mm -hmm. and uh, Qualcomm chips and things like yeah. that. So by moving that off to a dedicated chip, it gives you a lot of flexibility. One of the things that I'm uh, looking forward to is streaming content over networks. Mm. So since we have no, um, Obviously, you can't have infinite latency and infinitely low frame rate, but we can absorb a lot of latency. So you could go over a 5G modem out to something on the edge. So, and, and you're going to need this kind of processing to, to fix up yeah. any kind of dropouts that you have on the network. So this is going to be kind of a precursor to what you know edge computing yeah, is going to yeah. be like. Everyone's waiting for that, for sure. Oh, man, I've been watching that for <laughs> six years now. It's like hammer looking for a nail. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's, uh, if we're talking about like future, um, maybe we can end off because, you know, people watch my channel, they, they love talking about future of technology, the hardware that will go into things. What do you think, um, really, if we're, well, we'll just use Tilt 5 as an example, or like any AR glass, what do you think is going to get the biggest change, like displays, processing, lenses within the next couple of years? That's a great question. Biggest change. Uh, yeah, you know, maybe I can just ramble on about some of the things that are struggles and yeah. maybe I can come to a big change. So we have Moore's Law. So compute, we can predict where that's going to go. And one of, some of the challenges that we have in headsets is um, battery life and compute and thermal. And that's not going to change radically. There's no silver bullet out there for that. So your Oculus headsets and your HTC headsets are still going to be big bricks on your face if they have any amount of battery life and um, processing capability because you have to deal with that much processing, that much battery. and So no big changes there in particular. Uh, optics, again, it's I, I was joking in a recent podcast, like we need Moore's Law for optics, and it's probably going to be more pessimistic yeah. than actual Moore's Law because we can't double the field of view of AR optics every year like you're doubling the number of transistors on a, on a chip. So I, I think, you know, we're seeing like Nreal glasses like topping out at like 40 degree field of view, and they're all kind of topping out around this like kind of limit, and that all comes from how fast you can bend light in materials. So that's pretty challenging. I don't know if we're going to have any near-eye display, like big changes anytime soon. There are a couple areas that we're watching really closely because we think it's interesting in the long run. And uh, one of those is metamaterials, mm -hmm. uh, where 
basically you're making little tiny antennas on a substrate and you can do pretty crazy stuff with, with photons. So they get absorbed into these metallic antennas and you can do crazy things with them. Uh, it's super early days on that stuff and the efficiencies are super low. So it's not gonna be, Apple's not gonna come out with a metamaterial right, yeah. um, AR glasses display. Um, I think there is a lot of room in display tech that's pretty interesting. Um, we're looking at some stuff uh, for our headset that's going to like kind of drive form factor in a few years. Like, right. um, so we're starting to work with some stuff that's gonna um, improve our design in the long run. That's pretty exciting around displays. Mm -hmm. um, but displays are tricky too, like there's, uh, Micro LEDs. Yeah. Um, I was just on a podcast with Carl. Um, he's a little more pessimistic than I am, but you know those are interesting. They have potential of having some high efficiency, uh, but there's some really big manufacturing challenges. So um, that's going to take a little while to solve. Uh, OLEDs are interesting, um, but they're kind of topped out as far as brightness. And then it comes back to the world combiner or how you get the light into your eyes. The efficiency in these things are so low. Uh, it's hard to imagine like an OLED display being like super useful for like a waveguide. Yeah. But it might help a little bit with like an NREAL type bird bath a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I see for, for a long time we're going to be struggling to have the dream of walking around the world with monsters jumping out of buildings in a really yeah. compelling way. So, or you're till five and have fun until that day. And until it's we the best you got for a while, <laughs> is what she's trying to say. And we have a whole lab back here where we're doing research. So, you know, it's so funny. Sometimes people are like, you know, think that we're gonna do like projection AR for all eternity. It's mm -hmm. like, and I remind people like, if I could sprinkle magic pixel dust on the table and have holograms pop out of it, that's what we would sell. Right. But until that day that we can figure out how to have this compelling of an experience, you know, this is what we got. It's going to get better over time, and there's going to be other technology that, that shows up. Absolutely. I'm not a big fan of video pass-through. I think that, you know, I'll be surprised tomorrow when the Cambria announcement comes out that they really um, double down too much on video pass-through. Because there was a, actually literally today Zuckerberg posted on Facebook that they're going to talk about the mixed reality stuff tomorrow. Oh, okay. We'll so. see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think they put the cameras in the right place to even like... Yeah, they put them in a very maybe it's... strange place. They're doing some weird... I don't even know what to call it, but definitely weird stuff going on with that. Yeah, uh, we'll see. Um, the problem with video pass-through is you have a fixed focus display. And you have fixed focus cameras and cameras that are in funny places that are not in the center of your eyes. So you end up in this... And we tried this over and over again. Like if it was a way to do it, I would have done it instead of like doing something with 24 lenses per projector. But right. um, you end up in this really weird, uncanny valley kind of feeling. I don't know how to describe it. Like as much as you try to make it work, it just feels like an out-of-body experience. And I think that limits uh, mass market appeal. I think that there's real value in it and you can do and solve real problems with it, but I don't think it like solves our dream of like the perfect AR experience. It's just uh, another stepping stone to something better than this is what you're trying to say a little bit maybe. It's nothing better than that. Order yours today. Oh, it's okay, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, where, where, where can people order? Uh, Till5.com. Till5.com. Sorry I'm being such a... That's it's your job. It's in, Promoter. No, it's, but that's what uh, I'm sure. It is a, it's an exciting phase for us. Like the content's coming online. We can build the product. And so I have to talk about it and scream it from the top of the mountain. I I, I mean, I already ordered one um, not too long ago or well, it was a few months ago. And like now after trying it and demoing it, it's just like VR. Like it's just one of those things you have to experience once and then you'll be like, I got to go home and buy one. So, yeah, um, it's good. <laughs> <sighs> that's uh that's pretty much it um thank you jerry so thanks. much for thanks doing this. for indulging me with all my crazy stories and stuff and you like you've already spent like two hours like <laughs> i watched you through every room and looked at every like nintendo and atari and yeah yeah you. i mean if anything my audience will, will probably know that um i i am magnetized to madness so this was <laughs> perfect it was perfect yes <laughs> thanks
Um, yeah, uh, be sure again to check out Tilt 5, links in the description, and subscribe, I guess, yeah, okay. Yeah, click that bell. <laughs> click the, yeah, um, click the bell. <laughs> share. Yeah, share, like, retweet. Uh, good, yeah, okay, thank you, bye.